This bonus episode of the Agriculture Today podcast features one of three speakers at the 2019 Industrial Hemp Conference. The conference was held on May 22, 2019 in Pratt, Kansas. Links to the PowerPoint presentations of each of the three speakers can be found in the show notes of their respective episodes. In this episode, Dr. Jason Griffin, director of the John C. Pear Horticulture Center in Hayesville, reviews best management practices for planting, growing, and harvesting your first industrial hemp crop in 2019. Plant biology, nutrition, and variety choices are discussed. Here's Dr. Jason Griffin. Good morning. All right, not bad. Let's start out with a question. How many people in here have their industrial hemp license? Okay. How many people are how many people are in the process of submitting? Okay. Of you guys that have your license, how many people have seed on hand ready to go? Okay. Okay, that's about what we're running into. Lots of questions on seed. Well, thanks for having me here today. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm with Kansas State University, Department of Horticulture and Natural Resources. I run and operate the John C. Pear Horticultural Center, which is a little south of Wichita. And we are going to be uh, growing our first crop of industrial hemp this year. And I, I got to give a shout out to my colleague over at University of Kentucky, Dr. David Williams. Um, this would not be possible without him. He is entering his fifth year of industrial hemp uh, production, and he's been a, a great mentor on the phone and emails, and he's shared a lot of information with me. Um, so with no further ado, let's get going with this. Let's start this thing out with a confession. I grew up in upstate New York. From there, went to move to Kansas. Um, I have never grown cannabis. Uh, I suspect most people in here have probably never grown cannabis. That's another question. Has anybody in here professionally grown industrial hemp? All right, we got one. Excellent. So the information I'm presenting you, if you're expecting an in-depth conversation about my experiences with growing industrial hemp, that's not going to happen. Um, but I, have, I am a serious plant geek, and I have spent the better part of the last year doing my homework, getting ready for this. And um, I'm going to share with you the information. We're going to share with you some results from some other states that have done it. Um, and we are sticking to facts rather than what we think. Let's talk a little bit about the plant first, if you haven't grown or haven't experienced it. It is a native of, of Asia. Of course, it is naturalized here. You can find it all across the state. Uh, it is a wind-pollinated summer annual, which is an important fact for the grower, for the producer. So this thing, the seed bank germinates in the spring when the weather's right. This plant grows throughout the summer. As the days start to shorten, it goes into reproductive stage, flowers, drop seed, first hard freeze, dead. It is a summer annual, wind pollinated, and the pollen will travel a significant distance. If you're producing certified seed, the recommended distance is about three miles from your nearest um, contaminant plant. So it is is a a strong outcrosser. The plant is typically dioecious, so you have male plants or female plants. Occasionally you can get monoecious plants, but typically dioecious. The male plants are generally taller, less branched. They produce a lot of pollen, that's their job. Up tall where the wind is, leaves that pollen. The female plants are generally a little bit shorter. They're more heavily branched and they produce a lot of flowers, right? That's their job, uh, to receive that pollen and produce seed for the next generation. The root system is impressive. You've heard the rumors about this plant does not need water. This plant does not need fertilizer. Um, Don't believe that. Yes, the plant will complete its life cycle with with whatever Mother Nature gives it, uh, but if you want to go a high-quality crop, you are going to need a little bit of fertilizer, you are going to need some water on it. Uh, But the root system is part of why it's so drought-tolerant. It's a large root system in good soils. It's been reported to go up to 8 feet deep. That is impressive. Strongly photoperiod sensitive, uh, which, again, is really important for the production side of this. Warm growing conditions, loves that. There's no question we can grow it well here in Kansas. It's going to love our summers. Flowers when the days begin to shorten. So that's why when you go by these um, um, recreational cannabis facilities in Colorado or these CBD operations, that's why all the lights are there, uh, to keep this plant vegetative 
until they're ready for it to start uh, producing flowers and, and go reproductive. So um, generally they're growing under an 18, 18 hour light, six dark or 24 hour light to keep that plant vegetative. And when they're ready for it to flower, they go down to 10 or 11 hours of, of light and that's the plant signal to, uh, to start producing flowers. My colleagues around the country who have been growing industrial hemp varieties for fiber, grain, dual purpose, uh, they report to me when, when we were at a meeting last December visiting um, that there is an incredible varietal difference. The genetics by environment interaction is huge. A variety that performs really well at Cornell University and in central New York does not perform very well in Virginia or in Kentucky. So there are huge variety differences, which is why I'm really excited to get our plants in the ground because I suspect our growing conditions are considerably different than upstate New York and Virginia. And so I'm really anxious to see how these varieties are going to perform here in central Kansas. This is my plant torture chamber, a small 120 acre farm. We're going to have uh, industrial hemp all over this, this thing this, this summer. Um, our job at K-State our product is information. Um, I hope nobody out there is looking at me as a competitor. My job is not growing industrial hemp to produce and sell, but we are, we are producing information. We're doing research. Uh, we're getting that research out through our extension system. Uh, our job is, is, is education. And I do want to point out here at the bottom, <coughs> thus far we have not grown any industrial hemp. Uh, it, it, I've been talking about industrial hemp for several months now. Uh, and I have been accused in more than one instance of K-State's been growing this for years and they're just holding out on us. We haven't, we're, not, we're not releasing the information. We have not grown industrial hemp. Uh, this, is, this is our first year. We have no first-hand experience but what, that we can share with you. Please look for us in December. When are those reports due? I'm sorry? When are those reports due? Harvest yeah. Research. research reports? November 30th. Yeah, look for us sometime around early December. You'll be, getting, you'll be reading our reports. So we, that information, we are required by law, just like anybody else is going to be growing, at the, at, by the rules and regulations, at the end of this year, we have to write up our results and submit it, and it's going to be online, and anybody can, anybody's going to be able to look at it. So we're not going to sit on our data. So why are you going to grow hemp today? Primarily, we're looking for uh, three different crops. You're looking for the fiber, you're looking for the grain, or the cannabinoids. Um, and there's a whole range. People have strong opinions about each of those, uh, where, the, where the revenue is now, where it's going in, in the future. Uh, and we'll let the, uh, let the experienced economists battle that one out. Of course, you've probably seen this, this diagram before in various versions. This was in one of the USDA publications. Um, the uses of, of the industrial hemp plant, and it almost hurts the brain to think about too much, so... Don't think about it too much. I don't want any brain hurting here. Uh, but it gives us a ton of, a ton of uses for it. K-State's role again. We're going to be conducting our research, hopefully in four different locations. Um, this is my facility here, down in Sedgwick County, Lucas Hag out in uh, Colby, uh, Craig Roseboom in Manhattan, and Kerry Rivard in Olathe. So we've got four different sites around the state that we're planning to do this so we can really get a feel for how these different varieties are going to perform across the state, not just in our backyard. Our goal for this year, uh, so in December when you see our report, hopefully we're going to be able to report on, on these variety trials. Uh, we're going to be looking at some fiber varieties. We're going to be looking at some dual purpose varieties. Uh, we're going to be looking at irrigation requirements in order to, to get these things um, to produce a viable crop. Uh, again, it will complete its life cycle with whatever Mother Nature gets it, but, but we would like to produce a, a, a good crop. So we're going to look at some irrigation requirements. We're going to look at some fertility. I think I'm going to put 12 to 17 varieties in the ground, which should be nice. I, I, will, I will admit I currently have five on hand. I'm expecting the delivery truck any day now. Um, and again, we are really focused on this genotype by environment interaction. Um, how, how are these varieties going to perform in Wichita versus Colby versus, versus the Kansas City area? As you are aware, if you have read, industrial hemp must be below, what's the magic number? 0.3% THC. Right? That should be ingrained in your head. Um, and chatting with colleagues, again, around the country who have, who have grown this before, uh, my colleague in North Carolina uh, has indicated that each year, on average, about 10% of their fields go hot, go above 0.3%. Uh, so that's just something to keep in mind. 
if you've done your reading, you've done your homework, you know environmental stress plays a big role in the THC content. As the plant gets more stressed, it tends to favor THC. Uh, so, again, that's why we do the research. If my 17 varieties go hot and have to destroy my plots, no big deal. We've generated that data. We've got that information. I don't want anybody in here to lose their, to lose their crop. 10% uh, doesn't sound like a whole lot unless you're one of those 10. CBD, we are hoping to get our hands on as many of the high CBD varieties as possible. Again, looking at some variety trials, uh, we're going to look at in high tunnel versus outside. Hopefully the high tunnels will help eliminate or alleviate some of that plant stress. We're going to grow them like tomatoes. We're going to put them on plastic with drip irrigation. We're going to see what we can do. Uh, again, we haven't grown these varieties before, uh, but again, again, my colleagues who have done this before report that these high CBD varieties can be a little unreliable. We'll talk about the chemistry here in a little bit, um, but these varieties which produce high CBD also risk producing high levels of THC if things go wrong. So they're, they're just something to be aware of. It can be done. Obviously, it's being done in, in lots of states around the country. Um, that's where the research comes in. So if you're growing for fiber, obviously the goal is, is, is really strong vegetative, really strong vegetative growth. The variety selection is going to be key. Uh, which varieties perform, are going to perform well for us in different parts of the state. Planting date is key also. We'll look at some, some, date, um, some data from Kentucky here in a little bit. General recommendations. It's kind of funny, you look up any plant in the world and they all prefer a well-aerated, fertile, high organic matter soil. Um, of course it does, right? But, but we know the plant, um, obviously, it's, it's in many cases sometimes ditch weed. It can, it can grow in lots of different soils. Weed-free seedbed is important. There are no herbicides labeled for use in industrial hemp. Um, so getting those plants off to a start in a weed-free environment is important. Obviously, weed pressure can, can impact, uh, can impact the, 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 the production. Generally a half to three quarters, maybe. Some people go an inch deep, particularly if you're trying to get it down there for a little bit of moisture, um, but no, no deeper than an inch. Seeding rates depends on which variety you're looking at. The general recommendations are 40 to 65 pounds per acre. Kentucky sticks to about 60 pounds per acre. Uh, the goal is a really, really dense stand which can shade out weeds and uh, so you get nice, tall, straight fibers. And adequate moisture for the first six weeks is important. Again, my colleagues in other states, they, re they, they talk about this... Um, seedling vigor. These seeds germinate, they get to about four to six inches tall, and then they just stop, and they sit there for a couple of weeks while they're putting on root growth, and that's when the weed pressure comes in. I'll be curious to see if we run into this. We've, we've, I think we've got a really nice environment for growing. I'm hoping our plants will just keep, keep going and not get into this uh, seedling lag phase. Again, the reports, you'll see, well, these plants, they don't need any water, they don't need any fertilizer. Um, the general recommendations are similar to corn. Um, nitrogen is going to be the big thing for good production. If you're interested in growing for fiber, too much nitrogen creates poor quality fiber. So generally the recommendation is 50 pounds per acre pre-plant, um, and that's about it. Uh, for grain, it's, it's similar to producing high-quality corn, but uh, not too much fertilizer for fiber production because it reduces fiber quality. Again, the plant loves warm growing conditions. Uh, you're generally looking at about four months from, harvest, from, from seeding to harvest. Um, harvest occurs just about the time you see the male, about the male inflorescence, the pollen sacs. Just about the time you're starting to see pollen released is generally when you harvest for, a, for fiber. If you go too long, it affects quality. The quality of the fiber goes down. Best management practices uh, for harvest and, uh, and redding are, are still under investigation. Uh, it's, a, it's a rather unscientific, redding is a rather unscientific process currently. And the, the, the purpose of redding is if we're looking at the cross section of the stem here, you've got the, the, the xylem tissue is the bast fiber, um, the xylem tissue is the herd, file, herd fiber, the phloem tissue is the bast fiber, and the whole process of redding um, after you harvest that, that crop and it's laid down in the field, the whole purpose, purpose of the redding is to separate those fibers so that they separate um, for, for further processing. I generally recommend regions with perhaps a late summer high humidity or frequent rainfalls are going to be a good place to, to field rep. I don't know about you guys, we're pretty dry in October and November. I'm going to be curious to see how, how field redding occurs here. 
generally takes a couple of weeks. Um, lay the crop down, flip it over after a couple of weeks, give it a couple more weeks, and then it should be ready for baling if, if the environment is right. But again, the research is still being done on redding because it's so environmental dependent. The list of, of approved varieties for Kansas. Um, these are some common fiber varieties that you can find, and I have listed, again, a lot of people like, what source, where can I get it? These are some common sources that our, our colleagues in New Hampshire and North Dakota and Kentucky is where they're getting their seed from. Um, seed availability is sort of limited. Um, if you don't have your seed yet, you need to pick up the phone and call ASAP and see what they've got left in stock. So this is what they do in Kentucky. Um, when that field is ready to harvest, they simply mow it down, lay it down, and then the redding process begins, which again is high humidity, high moisture. Lay it on the ground, flip it over after two weeks to help those, those fibers separate. And after four to six weeks, if the environment is right, it's ready to be baled up and shipped off. Of course, everybody has their um, processor already lined up, right? That's gonna be one of the issues as well, is finding somebody to process that fiber for you. Redding can occur, um, you can put irrigation on it to help it happen if, if, if moisture is, is lacking. Uh, it can be done in, in water tanks, it can be done, there's lots of different ways it can happen. Some people report letting their uh, crop simply lay in the field over winter and to harvest it or, or bale it up in the spring. Um, that affects the quality goes down, but it's certainly one way to get the moisture and, and make sure that the redding process is completed. If you are seriously interested in growing industrial hemp and knowing more about it, I really, really encourage you to visit the websites of these other states who have been doing this for three, four, or five years. They're, all their progress reports are online. You go to University of Kentucky, Industrial Hemp, and you can find all their progress reports. And they're like four pages. They're really put together well. Uh, New Hampshire, Vermont has a really nice website. In Vermont, there are no rules when it comes to cannabis. You can grow whatever, whenever, however. There are no rules. So they've done a ton of research on, on the cannabis plant. All their information is online. There's, there's not holding anything back. So this is some of the, the fiber results from Kentucky. Uh, the magic number that they're shooting for is five tons per acre. And again, this, they've done this four years now, and last year was the first time that they were able to get above five tons per acre with, with some of their varieties. This is a May planting here, and you can see the results, the dry weight. They're over the, over the five ton per acre on their first one, two, three varieties, close with the fourth one. This is a June planting. Planting one month later, almost a 50% reduction. Uh, so planting season matters. They also don't irrigate, so obviously there's going to be a huge moisture difference between May planted and, and June, plant, June planted. So that data is out there. Don't hesitate to go out and look at it. A little closer to home, this is North Dakota State. You see several, several of the similar varieties. Several of these are on the, the KDA's approved list. And you can see again the dry weight yield. Uh, they did not reach the five ton per acre mark, but they got close with a couple of varieties. So I would just encourage you, really, if you're seriously interested in growing industrial hemp, visit these other states' websites that have the data up there and, and look at them. What if you're going for grain? Um, there's a tremendous amount of, of use for the grain, uh, hemp seed oil, um, toasted hemp seeds, uh, protein, flour, animal feed. There's a ton of uses for for the grain. And it's produced a little bit differently than, than the fiber. Again, variety selection is going to be important. They're generally a little bit shorter. They can be harvested with a combine. They're not 8 to 12 feet tall like the fiber varieties. Uh, but again, the, the latitude in daylight is going to determine when these things go, go to seed. So the variety selection is going to be really important. And generally a little more fertilizer, much like if you're going for high quality corn, is what you're going to, your fertilizer re regime should be. Because this has been an illegal crop for so long, plant breeders have not been working at it very long, so the, the, the inflorescence, the seed does shatter. Uh, generally, as it's about ready, uh, the, the seed at the base of the inflorescence mature first, long before the seed at the top of the inflorescence, and by the, if you wait until the seed at the top is ripe, you've already lost the seed at the bottom, it's laying on, on the ground. So the recommendation is when you see about three quarters of the seed is ready to harvest. That's what you, when you get in and harvest, uh, knowing that some of it's going to be some of it's going to be a little green still, but you don't want half of your crop ending up on the bottom of the on, on the soil. 
Again, it can be harvested with a combine. Uh, most people have some sort of modification on their combine to try and keep those fibers out. Um, fibers wrapped around gears is not a good thing. Uh, so they do have some sort of modifications on, 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 their, on their equipment. My understanding is that John Deere case are really getting into industrial hemp production full speed ahead. Um, and there's actually, John Deere just recently purchased an operation which is in Lenexa, maybe, Lenexa, Kansas, and that's going to be where they um, focus on their industrial hemp equipment. So obviously it's going to be great having one close by. Again, varieties, there's some of the common varieties that are out there which are grain varieties. And again, the same seed companies which are producing the fiber varieties are also producing the, the, the grain varieties. Again, I would encourage you to look at the University of Vermont. They've got a ton of information up there. Um, some of the similar varieties, some of these are ANCAs. You see pop up a lot of times. That's not on the approved list, but a lot of these others are. And let's see, total weight. You can see they're generally getting high 30s to low 40 pounds uh, per bushel. So again, we need our economists to get to work on this and decide what a, what a, what a good yield should be on that. Uh, Kentucky, again, the different colors are just two different locations. You see not a whole lot of difference in the varieties. Um, these are dual purpose varieties, and dual purpose is where you, uh, the name says it all, you plant your crop and you wait until the grain is ready, you harvest the grain with a combine, and then you go by and you harvest the, the, the stalks for the fiber as well. The dual purpose varieties, as a general rule, don't produce as much grain as the grain varieties, and the fiber is not as high quality as the fiber varieties, but you harvest more of your crop. You harvest the grain and the fiber. Um, I actually see some of the some of their data from Kentucky, and again, please visit the website and please look at their look at their data. It's right on there for you. It'll help you pick your selections, help you pick, pick your varieties a lot better. CBD and THC. Um, so this is where where the big revenue is right now. It's it's almost impossible if you're if you're doing a Google search for industrial hemp. It's almost impossible to avoid the CBD. It's actually sometimes difficult to find data on on fiber and grain because. The CBD is just, it's the giant in the room right now. Uh, the cannabinoids and the terpenes are the, are the big interest. They are produced primarily on the bracts of the female flower, so there's very, very little, almost undetectable amounts in leaves, stems, roots. Uh, so it's all about the flower for these varieties. So if you look up for CBD, obviously it cures everything. It doesn't matter what is bothering you. It even cures stormy weather, I think. It's just crazy. Um, but one thing you will see if you get into the literature is people talk about industrial hemp, and the, the low point, the below point 0.3 THC. They will use the term non-psychoactive, right? It's the non-psychoactive cannabis. Non-psychoactive, non-psychoactive. I avoid that term. I don't like that term at all. Because some of the primary uses that you see people promoting CBD for is anxiety, ADHD, stress, bipolar, OCD, PTSD, and depression. That's psychoactive. It's, if it's affecting that, if it's, if it's improving those afflictions, it is a psychoactive compound. It's just not intoxicating. You're not getting the high. Um, so I, I try to avoid using the word non-psychoactive, because it, obviously it is if it's fixing those ailments. A couple different ways to produce it. If you are a big grower in Kentucky, Alta Holdings, you have acres and acres and acres of these Christmas tree looking plants, which are on plastic with drip irrigation. That is a major operation. There's a significant amount of labor. There's a significant amount of equipment tied up in that. Uh, the other school of thought, right? you combine, you harvest each one of these when the flowers are ready. Uh, the other school of thought is maybe for these are also these are clones, so you're you're putting individual plants in the ground that you have purchased for about four or five dollars a piece. Um, the other option is you grow a crop that does not produce ten percent CBD. Maybe it only produces three percent, but you're planting it with a drill. You're letting it grow. And you're harvesting with um, you're harvesting with a combine, and as as my colleague in Kentucky says, you put a big diaper on your combine, you collect the chaff, and you press the uh, the oil out of that. So there's a couple different schools of thought on 
eventually what is going to be the best economic uh, return on investment. Is it the horticulture, which I call the horticulture production, or the agro- uh, economic production? And again, the economists will, will have to see. And maybe it's going to be different by region. I am a full professor with Kansas State University, so I am required by contract to show you at least one chemical structure. So thank you for allowing me that. that. Um, so the, 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 the funny thing about CBD and THC is they both have the same precursor, cannabigerol, CBG. And cannabigerol is either turned into, converted into CBD or THC. Um, either the plant has more of this enzyme or it has more of this enzyme, and that determines which, which direction CBG goes. Um, and obviously, environment plays a huge role in that, and that's why we're talking about plant stress, we're talking about drought tolerance. Um, there are a lot of things that can affect how these enzymes get upregulated and downregulated, and that's why growing these high CBD varieties can be risky. The plant has the ability to produce both products, and we obviously want ones that are favoring CBD for the purpose of this discussion. That's what we want, right? There's other people that might be interested in this. If, you're, if you want to produce really high-quality um, plants with high CBD content, it is the same thing as producing high-quality marijuana plants. It's, th- it's just that enzyme. This, the enzyme uh, is producing CBD or THC. So if you've got a college buddy that knew how to grow really good stuff, he can grow really good CBD. It's the same thing. It just depends which, which, um, which end product the plant is producing. So it's really easy to find best management production on how to grow high-quality CBD plants because it's the same as growing high-quality marijuana plants, just the plant produces CBD instead. Uh, but there's still there's very little information in the published literature. Um, there's lots of websites out there with funny names that can give you guidelines on how to produce that. Uh, but again, you're mostly interested in female flower buds, no males, uh, because that pollen really, uh, really affects the quantity and quality of CBD. So that's why you see uh, indoor grow houses. Um, you see these fields, and they do not want any males in their field. They, they rogue the males out. Uh, but we're still working on these best management productions uh, f- for uh, planting, production. What about fertilizer? Um, a lot of these people... Um, who are growing for high CBD. They don't want to use fertilizer. They love fertilizing with bat guano. They love using molasses and compost tea. Um, So there's a lot of research still to be done on the best way to produce these. (coughs) Curing and storage, the, the world is wide open for, the research world is wide open for this. Harvesting, you generally harvest when the trichomes start to change from that white. If you're looking right at the, at the, at the female buds, you see those trichomes, and they look like they've got this white um, glistening all, trichomes all over it. As soon as they turn from that white to the sort of amber color, that's when they harvest. If you wait too long, THC goes up. Um, so you, the, the experienced growers know by looking at their plants, all right, we're starting to get a few yellow leaves at the base of the plant. Um, it's time to harvest, because if we wait too long, THC spikes. And if THC spikes, you destroy your crop. Drying, obviously, there's going to be a lot of room for research. It seems kind of crazy to me that this is what people are doing, but um, there's got to be some big drying ovens, and there's, there's, there's a lot of research still to do in how to, how to produce this, this well. Seed. Obviously, we're stuck with approved varieties right now. That may change in the, in the near future. Uh, prices are generally for fiber and grain. You're looking at 10 to 20 bucks a pound at 60, 30 to 60 pounds per acre. You can do the math. Um, high-valued, semini- feminized CBD seed are generally a buck per pound or more, and they can be difficult to find, obviously. And a lot of these places are requiring con- contracts in order to, to sign them. Um, if, you're, if you're interested in growing CBD varieties and somebody comes to you with a, re- with a price that seems too good to be true, it probably is. Um, they should be expensive. The, the end product is worth high value, so the, the feminized seed should be expensive. Some approved varieties for CBD. Um, these are on the uh, these are on the KDA approved variety list. These are common, uh, high 
CBD producing. These are generally in the 8 to 12 percent range. And we hope to get some of those and, and grow some of those this summer and see how they, how they perform here. What can go wrong? This is the wet blanket portion of the... We, we build up all this anticipation and everybody's all excited to go out there and buy their seed and get their plants in the ground. There's a lot of things that can go wrong. Um, poor seedling vigor can be a huge issue. If you look through those research reports, other, other universities, you will see lots, you will see several years where they didn't get a crop because of a heavy rain two, three, four days after planting, uh, and the soil crusted and the seedlings couldn't pop through. You'll see lots of instances of, of that. So poor seedling vigor can be an issue. Uh, planting at the wrong time. Uh, if you plant too early, your plants end up too tall. Nobody wants to harvest a, a grain variety uh, that's, that's 10 feet tall. There are pests. You will hear uh, not only do you not need to water or fertilize, but there's no pests. Garbage. There are lots of pests. Um, University of Kentucky, again, their, their, their pathologists, entomologists have a really nice website on, uh, on industrial hemp pests. Corn earworm is a big one. Botrytis is a devastating disease. And there's a stem borer, uh, which, which can get in there and just cause the, the, the plant to collapse. Again, rain at the wrong time can be an issue. Uh, you have spent a ton of money on seed. You have planted it. You have cultivated it. You have irrigated it. You have grown it. And it goes hot. Crop has to be destroyed. Um, you have to delay harvest. And your seed end up shattering and all your, your grain ends up on, on the soil instead of, instead of in, the, in the bin. This is another issue. Um, we, we're not sure who's going to be processing in the state. You got a great crop, but who's going to buy it from you? Who's who's the processor who's going to buy that fiber or or buy that grain from you? Have that lined up. Or one of my biggest fears, something that we hope to address, is you're desperate to plant it. You buy whatever the seed supplier has here at the end of the year, and it just doesn't do well for us. One of my major concerns. This is Dr. Wells' uh, field at, at Kentucky. We hope to basically replicate this this, this year. When you come out to our, our place, we're going to have a uh, we will have an industrial hemp field day at the end of the year. We haven't put a date on that yet because we have not put seed in the ground yet. We're still waiting for our soil to dry. So once we get seeded, we'll know um, a, a better idea of when we'll be there. But this is what we're hoping to do: these small plots, these different varieties. You'll be able to come out. They'll be labeled. You'll be able to look at them. Um, and make some informed decisions on which one you think which ones you think are going to do best in, on your farm. Here's my contact information. Um, you're welcome to contact me by email. Um, I would encourage you to contact me by email. I can look at that blinking voicemail light all day long. It doesn't bother me one bit. Um, so please, yeah, go ahead and snap a picture if you need to, but you're welcome to email me, and we can share back and forth, and if you need me to come out and visit, we can do that as well. So... This has been a bonus episode of the Agriculture Today podcast. Agriculture Today is produced each weekday, holidays excluded. To listen to the latest episode or subscribe, visit agtoday.net. Agriculture Today is produced by the News Media Services Unit of the Department of Communications and Agricultural Education in the College of Agriculture at Kansas State University.